Hi, welcome back. This is the second update for my data for 2018. And in this update, I'd like to focus on U.S. equities. Now, looking back at 2017, if you are a U.S. equity investor, you had a pretty good year. And how good a year was it? The best way I can think of showing you how U.S. stocks did in 2018 is to look at their performance over the course of the year. So I've broken down by month what U.S. stocks did. In this particular case, I'm focusing on the S&P 500 by month from January through to 2017 through January 1st of 2018. In 10 of the 12 months, stocks went down. The S&P 500 increased. There was one month where it was relatively flat, April, and there was one bad month over the course of the year, which was August of 2017. The total returns that the S&P 500 made for the year, including dividends, was 21.85%. But only 2.22% of that came in dividends. The rest came from price appreciation. Now, before we look at how good that year is relative to historical performance for U.S. stocks, let's look at T-bonds. I focused on the 10-year T-bond rate, which started the year at 2.45%. For the first half of the year, the rate continued to drift down, down as low as 2.21% before coming back close to where it started and ending the year at 2.41%. Since the rate on the T-bond did not change much, the return on the T-bond over the course of the year, which includes both the coupon and the price change, is almost close to the coupon rate. The coupon rate was 2.45% at the start of the year. The additional price change was 0.35%. The total return on bonds was 2.8%. So stocks delivered about 21.65% in returns. Bonds delivered about 2.8% in returns. Now, how do those returns measure up against history? Perhaps the easiest way of getting perspective is to look at the data going back all the way to 1928. Now, I actually have computed on my website annual returns on stocks, 10-year T-bonds, and three-month T-bills every year going back to 1928. And if you look at the historical returns, Looking across the entire time period, 1928 through 2017, you can see that stocks on average, if you compute an arithmetic average, where I can just add up the numbers and divide by, by 90, comes out to 11.53%. A compounded average, a geometric average return, which I think is a more sensible way to think about stocks in the long term, the return was about 9.65%. On T-bonds, over that same time period, looking at compounded returns, the return you'd have made would have been 4.88%. So over the 1928 through 2017 time period, if you're a believer in mean reversion, that things revert back to the way they used to be, the geometric average numbers yield an equity risk premium of 4.77%. And this table, I've also looked at the last 50 years of data and the last 10 years of data so that you can see what the averages look like across time. And clearly, while 2017 ranks well above the historic norms, it was a more than average year in terms of delivering returns, don't get too excited. If you rank every year from 1928 through 2017 in terms of returns from high to low, 2017 would be your 30th best year. There were 29 years in, the, in, the, in this time period, now, over the 90-year time period, where you'd have earned higher returns than 20. So it was a good year, but it was not an incredibly good year. So again, I'm not being greedy. I'm just putting things in perspective. So that's what the historical data looks like. Now, normally, when you look at a year like 2017, where stocks go up strongly, you expect the fundamentals to weaken, at least relative to, price, to stock prices. What I mean by that is the stock price goes up 30%. Since earnings usually don't go up 30%, price earnings ratios decrease. So in a year like 2017, you should expect stocks to look much weaker on a fundamental basis after, you, after the year is done than before. But that was not true in 2017. 2017 was also a very good year for S&P 500 companies in terms of earnings. The earnings for S&P 500 companies went up about 17.6%. That's almost as much as the price appreciation, which meant that earnings kept track with stock prices. The big change in 2017 was in the cash return back to investors. That leveled off at pretty much what it was the previous year. There was almost no change. Now, normally, that would be a, a bad sign, a negative sign. But in 2017, that was actually a good sign, a sign of health. And here's why. 
In 2016, companies were collectively returning more than 100% of their earnings to their investors in cash. Now, it's not sustainable. You can't keep returning cash flows that exceed your earnings year after year without shrinking as companies. In 2017, because earnings went up and cash returns stayed pretty stable, the cash return ratio dropped to about 88%. Now, that might strike you as really high, but relative to the 10 year last 10 years, that number is actually now below the average rather than above the average. So the good news for 2017 is fundamentally U.S. stocks got healthier in terms of earnings and in terms of the capacity to return cash. Now, let's think about what this means for the rest of the market. If you look at the T-bond rate, the fundamentals are telling a different story than the actual rate. Remember, the T-bond rate actually didn't change much over the course of the year. It actually decreased a little bit from 2.45 to 2.41%. You're saying, is that a high rate? Is that a low rate? Now, the temptation you might have is to look to the Fed. After all, we've all been told that central banks had set rates, and you worry about what the next Fed chairman will do in terms of changing rates. Now, I'm a skeptic when it comes to the Fed. I don't think the Fed has as much power to change rates as you're led to believe. What I like to do instead is to focus on what I call an intrinsic risk-free rate. You're saying, what the heck is that? Now, there is an equation in Econ 101 called the Fisher equation that says an interest rate can be decomposed from expected inflation and an expected real rate. If you go further and make the expected real rate into an expected real growth rate, you can actually compute an intrinsic risk-free rate by adding the inflation rate to the real GDP growth rate. You think that's quite a reach. Well, in this graph, you can see how closely that intrinsic rate has moved with the T-bond rate over the last 50, 50 plus years. So in years where the rates were low, it's usually because inflation has been low and or the economy is not been growing fast. In fact, that's been the reason, in my view, why interest rates have been so low for the last decade is we've had a decade of low inflation and low real growth. That started to change in 2017. You started to see the, not inflation in any hyperinflation sense, but the coming back of inflation, a 2.2% inflation rate, and a real growth rate of 2.3%. Not, nothing to get overexcited about yet, but you add those two numbers up, the intrinsic risk-free rate in 2017 was 4.5%. Now think about it. The actual rate is 2.41%. The intrinsic rate is 4.5%. In my view, that's going to build pressure on T-bond rates to go up with or without the Fed intervening. So on stocks, the fundamentals look good. On interest rates, the fundamentals are starting to suggest a rise in rates is coming. Let's bring this together. Rather than focusing on the past, obsessing about last year, dissecting it to the nth degree, I want to look forward. Every month, for, me, for those of you who track this on my website, I compute a forward-looking equity risk premium. I call this an implied equity risk premium, but it's nothing fancy. Think of it as a yield to maturity computed for stocks rather than bonds. Remember how you compute the yield to maturity for a bond? You take the bond price, you take the promised cash flows, and you solve for that discount rate that makes the present value of your cash flows equal to the price of the bond. We do this with bonds all the time. I do this with U.S. stocks, and here's what I use instead. I use the S&P 500 as, the, as what I'm paying for stocks. I use expected cash flows on the S&P 500. And remember, those cash flows can come from either dividends or stock buybacks, and I have to make estimates for what they will be in the future. To make those estimates, I have to get expected growth for the future. And here, I do have to make a judgment call about that growth rate. I use the analyst estimate growth in earnings for the S&P 500, but not the analysts who track individual companies, but the analysts who track the entire index. And based on their estimates, the expected growth in earnings for the S&P 500 for the next five years, and this is the start of 2018, would have been 7.05%. So you'd have paid 2,673 .61 for, to buy the S&P 500 on January 1st of 2018, I now have your expected cash flows growing at 7.05% for the next five years. And then beyond year five, and this is something I do in my discounted cash flow valuation to keep myself honest, I bring the growth rate down to the risk-free rate. Why? Remember, I, we talked about the risk-free rate being expected inflation plus expected real growth. I'm bringing it down to the 2.41%, which is where the bond market is pegging inflation plus growth. So in a sense, I'm maintaining internal consistency.
Now, if I solve for my expected return with those numbers, I get 7.49%. You think, what does that mean? On January 1st of 2018, if you bought US stocks, I don't know what you hoped you would make, what you prayed you would make, what you thought you would make. Based on what you were paying for these stocks, you could expect to make 7.49% a year on stocks. You subtract out the 2.41%, you get an implied equity risk premium of 5.08%. Now, am I making some assumptions? Absolutely. That expected growth rate is an assumption. Now, it could be five, it could be nine, maybe analysts are wrong. But if you want, go in and download the spreadsheet and play with the growth rate. You'll see how robust this equity risk premium is to changes in the assumptions. And let's face it, the standard error in this number, the mistake you're going to make on an implied premium is going to be far smaller than the standard error you're going to get on that historical premium of 4.77% that we computed by looking at the 1928 through 2017 numbers. So 5.08% is the implied equity risk premium. You say, what does that even mean? When I'm valuing stocks in January of 2018, I will be using 5.08% as my premium for the US. I build off my premiums for other countries from that 5.08%. So it becomes the base that I use to value companies in January. You say, what about February? On February 1st of 2018, I will recompute the, the implied premium. It could be higher, it could be lower, but my job, in, in the way as I see it, is to value individual companies, not tell you what I think about markets. I'm taking the equity risk premium as the market price for risk. Now, you might not like that view of equity risk premiums. You might prefer to make market timing judgments, and I'll at least give you a framework for thinking about how you would do this. When you look at the 5.08%, if you're a market timer, here's the question you're asking. Do I think that implied equity risk premium 5.08% is a high number, a low number, or a reasonable number? If you think it's a reasonable number, if you think that's a reasonable price for risk, then you think stocks are fairly valued. If you think that's too low a number, that the number should be much higher than 5.08%, then you think stocks are overpriced. And if you think that number is too low a number, that the premium should, I'm sorry, too high a number, the premium should actually be lower, you're actually arguing that stocks are undervalued. Any judgment about markets is also a judgment about equity risk premiums. You're saying, how would I make that judgment? Well, I'll give you some history for the implied equity risk premium. In this graph, I have the implied equity risk premium going back to 1960. The average implied equity risk premium, so this is basically what I did in 2018, repeated back through 1960, the average is 4.16%. Now, you might say 5.08% is higher than 4.16%. Therefore, I think stocks are undervalued. I should go out and buy stocks. Just to play devil's advocate, though, the last 10 years, you've seen premiums rise, and the premium of the last 10 years has been 5.54%. So you could look at the last 10 years and say, maybe the premium is too low. I think stocks should go down. You can already see why market timing judgments can vary across people depending on the slice of history they latch on to. But you can make a judgment on premiums by looking at historical data and comparing it to today's premium. But you can already see why people who are so quick to call this market uh, a bubble are having a tough time getting their story to stick because this is in 1999. In 1999, the implied equity risk premium was 2%. Clearly, you'd have no trouble making the case that that number was too low. It was low against any historic norm. 5.08%? Much tougher to make that call. But if you want to make that call, that is perhaps a question you need to ask. Is 5.08% a reasonable premium for U.S. equity markets? So at this stage, you, you, can, you can make your own judgment. For, but for me, the way I see the 5.08% is that is the price of risk I will be using for 2018. Just to give you some perspective, that number at the start of 2017 was 5.69%. What caused it to decrease over the year? Two things. One is stocks rose. The second is cash flows froze. You bring those two things together, your premium is going to decrease. In fact, the only reason it didn't drop more is because expected growth rates went up from 5.54% at the start of 2017 to 7.05% at the start of 2018. Why did they go up? 
the, there are two reasons. One is 2017 was a pretty healthy year for U.S. stocks. Earnings went up by 17.5%, so analysts feel a little better about stocks. The other, of course, is the new tax code. is going to reduce the tax rate for U.S. companies, and many analysts are projecting a jump in earnings as a consequence. Well, we'll find out soon enough whether that's going to be true. So what's the bottom line? Am I worried about equity markets? I have never, ever not worried about equity markets. In fact, I'm glad I'm worried about equity markets. Anybody who tells you that they have no worries about equity markets is in denial. The nature of equities is they should always evoke worry. There should, there's always risk under the surface. That said, my worries shift from year to year. And this year, here's what I'm worried about. I'm worried about the fact that risk that T-bond rates are going to go up. Why? Because Not because the Fed is somehow going to raise rates. I don't believe that. But because the gap between the actual T-bond rate and the intrinsic risk-free rate has widened. So I think rates are going to go up. Is that going to be catastrophic for U.S. stocks? If everything else was frozen and the T-bond rate, rate went from 2.41 to 4.5%, your equity risk premium is going to collapse. That's going to be catastrophic. But I don't think that's going to be the case because as rates rise, Think of why rates will rise. They will rise because the economy is robust, because real growth has come, back. come back. If rates rise and the economy is robust, I think U.S. equities will overcome the hurdles. If rates rise and the economy stumbles, then we're in trouble. But that goes without saying. So for the next year, that's what I'm going to be watching. I'm going to be watching how Earnings at U.S. companies evolve as the new tax code kicks in. I'm going to be watching how much U.S. companies return to their investors from the trap cash they're going to bring back home and how much they reinvest. And I'm going to be watching the T-bond rate to see how it reflects what's happening in the economy out there. But along the way, I'm sure the, I will be learning lessons that I hopefully will be able to revisit at the start of every month when I update my equity risk premiums. Thank you very much for listening.